Kyoto Koto. Welcome to Agility Matters, where we look at adaptive organizations responding to customer needs in a flexible way. Tonight we have a special guest from Canada over in Toronto. He is Ron Delirio. And oh. he is <laughs> Sorry, live streamers. I can hear them in my ear. I've obviously pronounced that incorrectly. Um, hey, Ron, let's bring you straight in so you can all laugh at me. Thank yeah, thanks for laughing. Thanks for laughing. Um, you had one job. One job. You had one job. <laughs> uh, right. Welcome, Ron. Welcome, Cola. Everyone remember, who remembers Cola. Cola is a uh, partner here at Surge.Coach. Um, but, Ron, it's all about you. So, Ron, who are you? Where are you from? And does agility matter? Does agility matter? Uh, well, I'm Ron Laudadio, uh, but I'll work on changing my name to something simpler like Law, because uh, I clearly challenge people. So my apologies. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I, uh, I have um, I, right now. What am I doing? Uh, well, right now I'm helping organizations with their business uh, agility transformations. Uh, and um, I'm enjoying myself quite a bit with that, uh, simply because uh, I've also had a lot of experience in it. Um, I have held a role as uh, IBM uh, would give me, for example, certain roles of directorship. I actually was one of the agile leaders for North America for IBM. Uh, also held the role of chief technology officer. I also worked for CGI as a vice president leading agile for Canada. Um, and so the privy there that I had, which was an amazing privilege, was the ability to oversee a lot of organizational transformations, over a hundred of them. Uh, so it helped me get a good sense of uh, the kind of experiences that were successful and, un and unsuccessful um, in, in those organizations as they do their transformations. Um, so I, I, get, I get to profit from uh, overseeing a lot of those experiences. The other thing too is um, I've done a lot of executive coaching and uh, I had the privilege of working with uh, Shift 314, which is a boutique firm that helps train and consult uh, executives and leaders in transformations. Uh, the, uh, and that gave me access to uh, understanding firsthand and hearing from over a thousand leaders uh, about what their experiences have been and what their successes and failures have been in, in uh, a lot of their transformations. So I'm off now and, um, and uh, actually starting uh, uh, work with uh, Epic Agile. And uh, my ambition really is to help, uh, I would just say make peace in the corporate world. Uh, so many organizations have such interest in agility uh, and uh, really need a lot of help trying to figure out the new ways of working that that requires. Um, and so to answer your point, uh, you know, uh, is, does agility matter? Well, uh, yes, uh, I, 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 it's happening. Uh, so, you know, whether we think it matters or not really is in a way irrelevant. Uh, but to answer the point, yes, it absolutely does matter. The reason why it matters is because uh, most organizations today are designed for static steady state. They're doing a really good job. They figure out the prediction models. They set up their processes. They hire their people. They throw them in. Um, and and hopefully the processes work. And then everybody starts up these projects. Well, why? Well, because something's changed. So change is uh, always an exception state. Um, and uh, the the organizations that we've known for so long and the models that those organizations are based on for so long have been successful in the past, but they're not successful anymore. And the reason why they're not successful anymore is because the market is changing at a, an accelerated uh, pace. Uh, and in fact, in most organizations, you'd see that the amount of change that they've achieved in the last five years has been far more than the kind of change that they've achieved in the last 20 years before that. Uh, mm -hmm. So with accelerating change on an ongoing basis and organizations that are designed to be highly efficient in a static state, using uh, change state as an exception, uh, agility matters because most organizations who don't adopt agility and, and, and transform themselves to an, a, an agile organization um, uh, really will fail because they will not be able to keep up with the changing marketplace. They will not be, uh, they'll always see raising costs. And, and a lot of the organizations that I work with right now have these big cost saving efforts because they can't figure out why the organization can't, can't overcome the costs. Well, the reason why is because their change state is so costly. 
Why? Because they're efficient and optimized for static state. So agility matters because you have to find a way now to transform your organization so that change state is the steady state. That's the optimized state. And that is the state of agility. Um, so agility totally matters. And one of the things that we're going to talk about today um, is that agility matters not just for the organization, but also uh, uh, matters for the, the, the people who work in them. Um, and I have a lot of compassion for the kind of stress and load and challenge that people are being faced with because the organizations are imposing all these forces on them um, uh, and trying to use the, the traditional business mindset and the traditional business models. And it's just causing more and more stress in the workplace. Um, so agility matters to not just simply the organization, but to the employees because an organization that's optimized for agility is a peaceful place. It's a fun place. It's an enjoyable place. And it's where you can actually contribute and uh, and uh, and offer really your your talents and your skills in a meaningful and fulfilling way. Beautiful answer to the question, uh, Ron. Thank you very much for that. And you touched on the people, right? And you know, here at Surge, we are fully focused on people centric cultures. Um, so, from your point of view, agility, people. How do I say this? How, what would you focus on first? What is your main driver then that people's interest in? Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, I can take my, like with my practical experience uh, as opposed to a general, like what, what does Ron do? Uh, my, my initial approach and in how I like to work with organizations that need uh, or, or even have a desire for this agility or this new way of working, um, uh, my, yeah, my first approach would probably be working with leaders. And, and the, and the nice. reason for that is because they're the ones who have the most impact on how the organization works. Uh, and and as, as much as where I feel the pain, which is with the employees, although the leaders are typically a, a lot in pain when I'm talking to them, um, uh, and, and it's keen to go there. I think it, it, I like to work with leaders because there's much more impact in their decisions, in, in the way in which they uh, lead their organizations uh, well, because they have the power. Um, you know, ultimately, when you look at it, they're the ones who decide to hire, fire, and pay your paycheck. Um, so they also have the keys to the system. They can decide how the system operates, how the system works. Uh, but more importantly, uh, they shape a culture based on their behavior. Uh, is it a condescending, evil, chaotic, uh, aggressive environment to work in, or is it a pleasant, fun, enjoyable environment to work on? And and it's the behavior of the leader that sets that tone. It they're the mm -hmm. ones who actually tell everybody else who reports to them uh, uh, what is acceptable behavior and what isn't acceptable behavior. And one thing that's interesting that uh, I find fascinating about the new way of working in and 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 with business agility uh, is that. People are more effective, more productive, and organizations are more successful when you actually look at the happiness and well-being of people. And uh, uh, and really, ultimately, that's my goal. My goal is to spread happiness and well-being around the world, whatever I can do to do that. Um, and my first approach is to look at and, and help and support leaders in, in, uh, in their transformation, because then mm -hmm. after that, it ripples throughout the whole organization quite beautifully. I love that. So, so you have this purpose that's around happiness and well-being of people um i don't want to continue on till we define some things so let's first define what is a leader <laughs> that's a that's one of my most favorite topics right now uh, <laughs> and, and the reason for it is because i i i'm calling it it's not my own reinvention of a definition of who a leader is but uh it is um uh, i would say i'm pulling out uh, 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 a somewhat held definition of a leader, but it's not one that's always put in the forefront. Uh, and Simon Sinek uh, is one that really inspired me on this topic because he had talked a little bit about what it took like to have a, uh, what, was, what, what was important to be a leader. And he touched on a topic uh, that I thought was so important, but he didn't elaborate to the degree that I understood the topic a little bit more, which is why I think we're going to talk about it today about the difference mm. between hollow leaders um, and and true leaders. Um, and 
The reason why this is so important uh, about their behavior and whether they can or uh, can lead in a, in a non-hollow way uh, has to do in, with my passion, which is you know happiness and wellness with employees. Um, because if you look at employees and people who work in these organizations, uh, you, you try to figure out, well, what do they desire? Like what, what fulfills them and what makes them happy? And there's a lot of studies on this, mm. but you can, you can look at it from a sense of contribution, uh, uh, a sense of making an impact. Uh, mm. Like a lot of people have a hard time hiring millennials um, simply because, you know, in their interview, they're like, well, I want to make an impact. Um, and with the traditional mindset, it, it sounds like they're just entitled. Uh, but in fact, they're the ones showing us the way. They're the ones who are actually showing mm. us really what it's like to be a human in an organization. Because we get fulfillment out of having impact. Um, it's not just the fact that we earned five bucks today. It's the fact that we made a difference that really is quite fulfilling. Um, and yeah, we got to feed our family with the five bucks. But after we get the five bucks, what is it? Um, it's also contributing to something meaningful. If you, yeah. People feel a lot of wellness and, and happiness when they feel like they're a part of something. Something social, but also something collaborative. But more importantly, something that's meaningful. Um, and people... When they have a reason for being motivated, they don't feel pushed and shoved and coerced and manipulated. And, uh, and a sense of belonging is also um, a, a very important thing. And Gartner, sorry, not Gartner, I'll talk about Gallup. So Gallup is, a, is an organization that uh, historically just looks at statistics and tries to make measurements. But I think what they've tripped up on is some really interesting surveys that point specifically to uh, happiness and well-being of organizations, uh, sorry, employees, because what that does is it positively impacts the organization, not just the employees. Uh, and they statistically uh, uh, demonstrated that. So it's not just fluffy, you know, uh, conversation about why I have to make my, myself happy. Um, but, that, but that's the one thing. The other thing, too, is when I look at leaders and, and what leaders desire, uh, whenever I sit with them, um, which is unfortunate because a lot of times they approach me and say, well, Ron, my, my people are, are demoralized. They're not engaged. Um, they don't feel invested in our cause. I can't get them excited about making 5% more revenue next year. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> cutting costs really for some reason upsets them. And, uh, you know, I, I need employees that are eager to go beyond achieving the objectors. But I just can't, like, I just can't find it happening. And, and so, Ron, can you fix my people? Uh, and, uh, and of, of course I say, yes, absolutely. Let's sign the contract and I'll fix your people. But what I do instead immediately after is I book meetings with them and only them, because really, I think to the point that we're bringing across in this concept of agility and leadership, uh, is that it's really about them. So what would it take for, uh, uh, both employees and leaders to get what they want, right? Leaders want highly engaged, impassioned, excited employees. Uh, and employees just mm -hmm. want to feel like they have an impact and make contribution to the world and do something meaningful and fulfilling. Uh, well, leaders typically go uh, uh, out for training on communication, on empathy, on strategic thinking, on business storytelling, uh, you know, working also on their charisma and their ability to, to, to have presence, for example, uh, in the room, in any conversation. Uh, and they go as far as active listening and other other things, I, and those are well and good. Uh, and I'm not going to knock that. Those are those are well and good because those are the practices of leadership that help leaders become uh, leaders. But mm -hmm. to make the connection point that I I really uh, uh, would love to bring across today is the fact that those that invest a lot of their time in empathy and strategic thinking and business storytelling and charisma and active listening can can continue to do that. But what they do is they shape themselves into what I call a hollow leader. And the reason why that they're hollow is because when you talk to the employees, they still see them, see the, their leaders as more man managers, really. Uh, and the reason why that's important is because this one pivotal concept, and that is, does your leader hold a vision and a purpose for the reason why we're all doing what we're work, our, our work today? Because if a leader actually uh, themselves have an inspiring sense of purpose and a, and a beautiful vision that people can not only uh, understand and connect to, but emotionally get connected to. They feel as if this is something that they can actually connect with in the world and, and aspire to do, then that leader is a followed leader. And 
the reason why this is so incredibly important is because uh, ones that don't have a very strong sense of purpose and vision are ones that I would just argue continue to be a manager. And managers mm -hmm. are obeyed. You have to mm -hmm. obey. Like, I don't know what your experiences are, but if I don't obey my manager, I, I tend to have negative consequences. Um, either I get more stick and less carrot, or, um, or, or you know, uh, uh, I don't get successful in that organization. Uh, and that's the way in which people look at their leaders today, right? How do I make uh, Colart happy today? Because, you know, otherwise, if Colart, if I don't make Colart happy, then I'm not going to be able to have a chance to make Colart happy tomorrow. Hey, I'm happy. always happy. <laughs> it's a really good point, Ron, you make there. Because, um, um, you know, here at Surge, we, we actually made Colart the manager. So he, I don't think he actually wanted to be the manager, but we've made him. He's the chief people officer. Uh, which there we joke about pretty, quite pretty absent. <laughs> and I, I definitely don't wake up every morning trying to make Colart happy. Um, <laughs> uh, well, this, well, it's a very good point, though, isn't it? it? Whereas if I woke up every morning thinking, how can I make Colart happy? I would do things in the best interest of Colart and not my company. Bingo. Absolutely. And, and, uh, and, and, and how, uh, how motivated would you be on an ongoing basis? To, to just simply be there to, you know, satisfy the whims of Colart, right? From this project needs to be successful, tell me it's going to be successful, get me coffee, mm. make sure that, uh, you know, this thing doesn't happen, run an experiment as long as it always works and it's highly successful. And like the way that these, these people uh, behave in a managerial perspective causes a mm. lot of stress. And it also depends, um, is Colart on holiday or is he not? Oh, that's an interesting take. You know, the, what's that phrase? Uh, um, when the cat's away, the mouse will play, right? Um, uh, but what's more important is, uh, and this is actually it's a good point about wellness and happiness, is that when, when certain managers uh, re remove themselves from the environment for a couple of days, mm. all of a sudden the, the, the workplace becomes a nicer place to work with um, uh, and, uh, and people enjoy their work a little bit more. And I think that's a, that's a sad sign, unfortunately. Um, so, but, so Ron and, cool and Mikey, sorry to interrupt you both. You're, you're very caught caught up in the in the whole flow there. Um, I was I was just really curious. What sort of traps and pitfalls have you seen um, with that would kind of you know for, for if I was a, a one of those sort of managers that's worried about and concerned and perhaps even um, interested in developing leadership and my whole stance. Um, what what sort of what sort of traps and pitfalls would I what I need to watch out for as somebody who's sort of uh, early on that journey. Uh, well, and I think it's closer to the point that I'm trying to bring across that, you know, the reason why I jokingly called this uh, talk, the, the last leadership the last talk one. Of the yeah. year, I, and primarily is because I honestly think that a leader, it really needs to focus exclusively on vision and purpose. Everything else will start to follow. And, and, and yes, you can teach yourself about, you know, presence and charisma and storytelling and, that will make you a more effective leader. But the reason why I think this is the last talk that's really most important is because if you don't have a sense of purpose and a vision, you're not going to inspire people. You're not going to help them feel more impact. You're not going to get them more engaged. Uh, you're not going to achieve everything that you desire. So the, the pitfall, unfortunately, for most leaders today is that they follow the status quo. They're the ones mm -hmm. who actually follow what their leaders and their footsteps have done. And to the point that we talked about why agility matters, that kind of leadership doesn't survive anymore. Um, and because people need a different workplace. Like, for example, let's, let's call out examples of leaders, right? So, and a lot of people like to use the cliche of Steve Jobs. Is he a leader? Yeah. Well, yes. Okay. Is he a manager? Oh, absolutely. Did he hire and fire? Oh, no doubt. With, you know, fanfare. Uh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, but the reason why Steve, I think, was not a hollow leader was because he had a sense of purpose. There was something that Steve was really upset about, and that he, did, he, he really was upset about the complacency of humanity. And he thought that mm -hmm. we were becoming more and more complacent as a, as a race. The, and, and so for him, status quo was the enemy number one. Yeah. Um, so he's always been in passion personally, and he created Apple as a movement, really, because he wanted to disrupt the status quo. Uh, he bumped into Steve Wozniak, who knew computers, and so his vehicle for disrupting the status quo yeah. was computers. Um, yeah. And you'll hear that echo in the beginning of the marketing messages. Uh, yeah, I think different. 
Yeah. Absolutely. They were deliberately different. Um, and then Richard Branson, again, is a great leader. And I don't think he's a hollow leader. Uh, mm. I think he was one who had vision and purpose that people could aspire to initially because he got very angry that there was a bunch of uh, uh, senior people in California uh, and in some cases Chicago who decided who the masses got to listen to because they glanced right. over a lot of talented people and, and, and bands because they didn't think that they fit the formula. There was no guarantee that they were going to get profit on them. And because mm. Richard got so angry at that, he didn't want to become a manager. He didn't want to become a leader. But he was so enthralled by the passion, the fact that he wanted the people to decide what they wanted to listen to. So for those that he thought were talented, he started Virgin Records and Tapes and put out those bands that were constantly being passed by the by well, the major record labels. Oh, Ron, just to just to kind of develop that that framing a little bit, um, you've you've named two quite prolific entrepreneurs. I'd say that they'd have this dimension of visionary, um, that developed a fellowship, um, and that, that kind of movement then carried them into history as we know it. And it's a very common kind of trope, right? Like the the, the, the hero's journey almost. Um, how does that how does that relate to people that are really inside an organization and can't see themselves in that way? They feel like they're carrying, you know, some other legacy uh, forward, you know, I got hired into this role. I'm taking over from somebody else. Um, uh, I, I've got some new ideas, and I want to be a bit fresh, but I also don't want to rock the boat too much. Um, I also got to move a little bit cautiously because, you know, it's it's not always as uh, as easy as you know. Kind of, I've learned from experience that running in and and shooting from the hip and doing lots of things, uh, being too visionary, uh, can often backfire. Um, mm -hmm. So what advice would you, or, or how does that, that sort of framing, um, uh, how, do, how would it support somebody in that sort of situation where you're, you're inside someone else's kopapa, as they say in Māori, as the, uh, someone else's work, uh, someone else's um, original idea or vision? That's a, uh, so what I'll do for that then is I'll call up a third example, who I think is a bigger leader and a more important leader and actually more of a leader than Steve Jobs and Richard Branson. And that is a 14-year-old girl, Greta Thunberg. Mm -hmm, and yeah. if you look at Greta Thunberg, honestly, she is more, uh, she's a greater leader than Richard Branson and Steve Jobs. She doesn't own anybody. She doesn't own a corporation. She doesn't own an organization. Mm -hmm. She she didn't, she's not a manager. Uh, she didn't want to be a leader, but she is followed. And mm -hmm. that's that's the opposite side of being a hollow leader. A hollow leader is one who, who works on the practices of leadership without purpose and vision. A followed leader is not a manager, right? They are, and they're not bombastic. They, mm -hmm. And also they don't necessarily have to own an organization or, or, or own staff. They're followed because they have a sense of vision and purpose that mm -hmm. people can connect to and get, and, and get passionate about. And mm -hmm. they're, and, and so to your point, well, what could I do? I'm not a manager. What, how could I be a person like that? Well, yeah. look at Greta Thunberg. Um, mm. The reason why Greta Thunberg is such an incredible leader as opposed to Richard Benson and Steve, Steve Jobs is because when you're a manager, people are assigned to you specifically. There's a solid line HR relationship and you have power mm. over those people. But in my definition that I want to call out is what leadership really is, is the question of, are you followed? Because I don't think it's any of our rights to say I'm a leader. Really, I don't think you can declare that. You can declare you're a manager because that's a fact based on an arrangement and a contractual and employment arrangement. But you can't stand up and say I'm a leader. And the reason for that is because I only think that you're a leader if people choose to follow you. Mm -hmm. And that's really ultimately what a leader is. right? And that's the influence I, lines. Yeah, That's it. Like if you eliminated the managerial relationship, would you still want to uh, help th the person that you're following uh, achieve their vision and their purpose? Do you feel st still feel an emotional yeah. connection to them? Yeah. And Greta Thunberg is a great uh, leader for us to use as a cue of the new way of working and the new way mm -hmm. of being, especially in organizations that are focused on business agility. Because so if people one, want to one feel- gap in that. Sorry, Ron. One, one, yeah. one sort of piece there that that's that's not clicking for me, and I, and I love Greta. Um, 
is she doesn't carry the the burden of responsibility for an organization and i you know and i know that you and i have reflected quite a few times on um experiences especially your journey with webkins i've had i've had experiences where i've been on one side of the table pitching ideas and saying you know down with status quo let's put an ideas board up here and do some crazy stuff and you know why would you listen to me bossy person <laughs> and then there have been times when i've been on the other side of that table and carried the the burden of responsibility and held the budgets and held it and then you know your brain basically goes to 50 different places um before it can say yes to something um and 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 that was that to me is a big difference between greta at the moment and and it might change because as her movement gathers momentum and um and the structures start to evolve around her um and require requiring her to show up in a different way and i know that, that that's her personal journey and i'm just reflecting or connecting back to um, people that are inside that organization because i mean we've talked about this before where uh, in my experience the the kind of boards um and the execs tend to get it i mean they get this thing like we've experienced more change as a species in the last 20 years than we have in our in accumulated history on the planet right mm -hmm. so there's this massive acceleration and they're feeling it and um and then there's this employee level that right down at the con full contact with customers and right down in the in the kind of grassroots they get it and there's this sort of middle layer that's trying to hold the two worlds together um and and uh, my heart goes out to to the humans that are caught up inside uh, the the old and the new, right? There's this, almost this kind of war of ideologies, the new way of working, as you call it, um, versus um, what what is what has brought us there. You know, the the honouring the the what got us to where we are now, as mm -hmm. often those institutions, institutions of management, institutions of finance, and and these sort of professional uh, long running things. And I guess that's that's just where I'm kind of curious. And what are your thoughts on if we had to take the Greta Thornberg, if we inspired Greta Thorn, the Greta in in each of us inside those organisations, would they strain against the burden of responsibilities that they already carry? And what kind of messaging can we give to middle managers that are that are, are caught in this sort of tension? They're trying to strike the balances between all these things. Um, yeah, what are your sort of thoughts on on that? Yeah, I, I, you know, um, we can talk to the whole aspect of, of what happens to those roles when 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 transformations happen. But I, I but I think you know we'll leave that for for Mike to, to talk about in another in another. <laughs> uh, well, more importantly though, is that you know if you're if you're in that role today. Uh, how could you be inspired, or what could you take away from from this yeah. talk? And I, I'd rather invest more in that. And and again, it's it's the um, uh, it's the inspiring concepts that Greta actually uh, provides us. And I, and I'll explain. So when I uh, then the reason for that primarily is because uh, in, in most organizations uh, 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 there's a lot of tension between mm -hmm. the leaders and the doers. Um, yeah. And so what ends up happening in most traditional IT constructs is the middle management become the henchmen. Um, they're the <laughs> ones, uh, uh, you know, who have to have the whip in their hands and the guides in the hands and they're the evaluators and they're the judges and they're the ones who, yeah. and that, that creates a lot of tension. But uh, I'll come out with a personal story and experience that really will help shape the, the what I'm trying to say about the middle management. Because I was middle management in IBM. Uh, no, most people don't know me in the world as the CEO of IBM. Uh, the global was clearly I was somewhere in middle management somewhere. But what what had happened uh, in my experience at this time was that I was uh, uh, in my role of chief technology officer. There was a lot of projects that um, uh, uh, were handed to me because there was a technology problem. Um, and you know, a CTO, Ron, you know, there's a major technology problem. You know, you go do it. You go go solve the problem. And so there was one project that was handed to me. And uh, the technology problem was the fact that they were using artificial intelligence to try to detect fraud, and 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 because fraud really impacts all of us in a very negative way. It's a it's a it's a sophisticated crime that that uh, that holds people victim in unfortunate ways. And so, more in this case, the biggest victim was a financial institution that saw money just leaking away because they couldn't recoup this money that was stolen from them on an ongoing basis. Um, so it was wise to use artificial intelligence to try to detect this stuff because it was otherwise very difficult for machines to actually figure this stuff out. But the problem was is that the AI wasn't integrating properly. It wasn't being successful as they thought their initial models weren't being replicated at scale. Oh, I heard that, Michael. That's great. Thank you. So, <laughs> and I'll, 
I'll take. I'll, I'll we, have to, we have to remind our audience that it's like four o'clock. What's it like? Half past four in the morning for Ron. <laughs> yeah, it is. I am not a so professional well. videographer. I should have myself on mute. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, it's okay. So, but it, but when I took over this uh, this project and I was asked to improve this project. It was a very large project that had almost a thousand people involved, both in the financial institution as well as in IBM. And uh, and what I what I what I realized very quickly, it wasn't necessarily the technology that was the challenge. Um, it was the people inside. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, think about it. Like you're 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 a coder, you write you write Java or you do graphic design on an interface for a fraud project for a bank. Like in a way, it's kind of demoralizing when the manager just says, you know, you're not fast enough. We have to work for the weekends. You're not good enough. Uh, you're not meeting my expectations. So you're going to suffer. Like this is yeah. these are the messages that they were constantly getting in this project. Uh, but what I really realized was that, uh, it, well, actually, it was selfish. I have to argue. Like, why did I take over the project and why did I want to work on the project? And the reason for that, then again, goes back to my personal purpose in life, which is to spread happiness and wellness around the world. And one mm -hmm. thing that my heart went out to when I started hearing about this project and the purpose behind this project was the fact that it helps people around the world by preventing more preventing victims from happening. Mm -hmm. Victims of like identity theft, right? Victims uh, of people who have credit card um, uh, uh, crimes against them. And they're stuck with the bill uh, yeah. and, and the challenges. Ones who have their credit ratings just ravaged by the whims of somebody who wanted to make $30,000 that day um, and had to piece together their lives for, for seven years. I honestly think that, that was my connection. That was the reason why I took this project on. And I communicated that to everybody else. That's really it's the reason why I'm here. Um, and, and it's because I believe very much in this project and making wellness and happiness around the world. Wow. Um, and And... What I also did is I took it a bit farther. I, I had a town hall meeting with most of the leaders in the organization that were actually going to be a part of this project or in this project. And, and I brought up three, three people who were affected by fraud in that financial institution. And the one that really provoked a lot of emotion in everybody was a woman who was a consequence of fraud because someone invested in a third mortgage on her house through oh, wow. the power of identity theft. Uh, her husband had passed away 10 years before her only value that she was sitting on was what she was living in. Uh, yeah. And someone extended a massive uh, third mortgage on her house uh, and pulled the funds and she had no means by which to pay it. Uh, her house got recouped by the financial institution and she's destitute. She's no ability to earn money. She's no ability. It just, it was so sad to hear and see this experience. And what I did in that moment, though, was I used just simply reality for people to recognize the reason why we're here together today. The reason why the thousand of us are working with this financial institution to try to improve how we detect and, re and re uh, uh, um, eliminate fraud is because of these people. Like that, That's the mm -hmm. whole point. That's why I'm here. That's why I want to make this, this whole thing successful. And, and hopefully you guys want to follow me as well. How, how did that play out? What happened? Immediately, huge changes in the organization, like massive changes, because all of a sudden people felt engaged. They felt a sense of purpose for this stuff. And honestly, guys, I didn't have to change technology. Everybody thought it was a technology whiz after the fraud project went straight because I went in and I fixed the AI. I didn't fix the AI. I fixed the management structure by which we were involving our employees. I, I gave everybody a sense of purpose. And so people sprung out of the, in their step. They jumped out of bed because they there was one more step that they wanted to achieve to make sure that the other team could be successful in what they wanted to achieve because the other team wanted to be successful and they wanted to achieve because they all felt like they were part of a big movement. So we weren't a project. We were actually a movement. And I would inspire and I challenge any person who has people that report to them to start to look at what they're doing. Like, why are you in your job? And, and if you can't get a sense of purpose, find one. Because I honestly think that if I can find purpose in a in a fraud project for a financial institution, I'm sure you could find some kind of sense of purpose mm -hmm. somewhere. And, yeah. and not only just simply find it, but commit to it. Hold your career responsible for it. I, I, I can jump Invest in on, on that one, Ron, though. I can jump in on that Go one. That I don't think you need people reporting to you. 
um, which I think you guys spoke about before we started. Um, Thank you. Because I'll give you an example. I was at New Zealand Police and we were doing a project that was uh, a data integration project to relieve information for people on the front line. How boring is that? A data app? Yep. Now, if, if data apps get you, get you all fired up, then fantastic. Love it. Put, go ahead. Enjoy your life. Um, but no one really cared. There was like 60% contractors. It was like, Mikey, go do Scrum. Scrum will make them deliver more. And I found one person, one of the police officers, saying the true. Now, he wasn't a senior sergeant. He was just a sergeant. Now, obviously, hierarchy, right? So senior sergeant is above. They're 5% of the New Zealand police force. Uh, so the other police officers didn't listen to him because he's just a sergeant. And I said to him, that is amazing. I want you to say that in our next uh, uh, like show and tell. He stood up and he said, I want to save six children's lives. Oh, wow. Everyone's just like, like wow. I, I'm getting pinpricks thinking about it. Just, we're going to yeah. save six children's lives. Because he saw everyone stop, he carried on. If we were to do this, we give the data in the right hands at the right times to ensure those children's safety, and that will save six children's lives per year from now on. The whole project just went straight. I mean, I'm not saying it's a raging success, because it wasn't, but it went exponentially up from there on. And it wasn't because we implemented Scrum. I think everyone thought it was like, ah, oh, yeah, Scrum's amazing. Yeah, Scrum Masters. Get some Scrum Masters in there. No. It was getting somebody who wasn't actually the leader to be a leader for some sort of purpose. And I'll tell you, they had everything yeah. under the sun. They had design thinking. They had Scrum. They had all these things that were amazing. But it all, they didn't do anything because there was no purpose. There was no vision. But I fully back you. Go in tomorrow. Anyone who watches this video, go in tomorrow. Look at why you get out of bed in the morning. Articulate that. Make communicate it that. Make it personal. We're humans. I mean, uh, Colart, our own study, um, we looked at the, um, the customer value increases. The only one that had no correlation with success with customer value was money. No one cares that the company makes more money, but they do care that they make the customers happier. Find that. Find that link. Beautiful. Thank you, Ron. That's a that's a great reflection, and I'm very happy to uh, engage that with you on that, which is why I'm going to bring up a question. Sure. Colin has been asking some questions, and um, I found one for the right, the right time. So Colin asks, um, boom, boom, fancy. Don't you think that a leader in the enterprise has to balance the needs of the organization with those of the people? Now I have a biased answer here. So, Ron, what do you think? <laughs> Balance the needs of the organization uh, with the employee. Well, I, I would offer uh, a challenging perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, what is an organization? Uh, it, an organization is a collection of people, processes, structure, tools, whatever it is. Um, people... Mm -hmm. And how they interact with each other and processes and tools. Really, in, in a way, when you look at an organization, that's really all it is. Um, and uh, in today's traditional IT approach, uh, organizations are processes, right? Big structures and processes. And then we hire people to, you know, insert into the holes of the processes to make it work. Um, and so that question is like, well, what are the needs of the process? And what are the needs of the employees as opposed to that you know, the other way around? And in, in, in my mind, uh, uh, you have to look at it collectively. And the, again, I'll, I'll, re I'll resort back to Gallup. Uh, Gallup really had an incredible epiphany when organizations came, because the organizations came to them and said, look, Gallup, you've been asking millions of questions and you've been getting millions of answers. And, and they're all well and good, but we want to make money. The organization needs profit. So what do we do? And can you give us statistical data that shows the questions that we ask and the answers we need to, from employees so that we can make more money? And so Gallup went off on their own and they, they decided to do their analysis and they, they went through the millions of questions that they've asked employees on, 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 employee, on companies' behalf for whatever various reason. But they also then started connecting it to the, the results of the organizations. 
the financial results of the organizations and looked for correlations to say, if I asked this question, I got this answer, the organization's needs were met and also actually achieved and exceeded because their profit, revenue, market share went up, whatever the metal was. And Gallup came up with the Gallup 12. They came up with the 12 questions to say, if you ask these questions and your employees respond favorably, then your organization is going to thrive. And it's statistically viable. And they it, it it's in the data. Don't change the questions because then you're 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 losing the data. Uh, and but you you have to look at the data. You can't defer it. But what if you when you look at the questions, it's all about satisfying the employees' needs. None of them are about employing uh, satisfying the the organization's needs. So what they have proven statistically is that if an organization first focuses on the needs of the employee, the needs of the organization is automatically met. So it's questions like, mm. do you have a friend at work? Do you feel that you've been uh, 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 rewarded or at least re recognized for your contribution yesterday? Do you have the tools that you feel that you need to get your job done? Like they're, they're, the questions are rather beige. Like they're, they're not like incredibly overwhelming uh, 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 questions. But when you look at all 12 of them pieced together, they are focused on do, does this organization meet your needs? So that that way you can have to do your job. The second uh, uh, survey that Gallup came up with, which I think is incredible, and it's just recent, um, and that is that they've statistically mapped the well-being of your employee to the well-being of the organization. Beautiful. So the causality is not, it's not if your organization's needs are met, then your employees' needs are met. It's, it's never that way, and they've proven that. What it is always consistent is, is if your employees have a general well-being uh, collectively, then the organization will thrive. And their questions are very simple. The two questions are, if you can picture your life right now as a ladder that has 10 steps, what step are you on right now? Yeah, your whole life, not wrong. just where you are at work. Yeah. I, wanted, I, I, I did want to let Colot have a go, but I want to ask you a question because Colot knows what I'm going to say, okay? <laughs> we have an example here in New Zealand, right? This is probably another video I'm going to have to edit this out of. Um, Obviously, COVID was an unprecedented situation. Yeah. Okay. Some companies, yeah, I won't name, I won't name this time. Um, some companies reduced employees by 30 to 40% up row. Didn't ask their opinions, didn't, didn't engage them, just basically went, right, their numbers, we need to reduce revenue, 30 to 40% gone. Um, does that fit your model of, one equals the other. So the, uh, the, the this this is a very good question because then it points back to the other question that we were talking about, which mm. was you know what do you do as a leader when the burden of the organization is on you, um, and, and how do you inspire people? I uh, there there's a lot of examples out there of organizations that had cut a lot of employees because of COVID and. Mm. The reason for it is because it's standard protocol, right? If you ever have an MBA, like this stuff is trivial to you. You have to right size your cost structure. You always yeah. have to daily. Um, and so the math was just simply done to say, well, if I can't sell 30%, uh, if I have a 30% reduction in my product sale, uh, well, actually, you know, it would probably be less than that because of profit. If I have a 30% reduction in profit, then I'm going to have to right size my costs. And sorry, 30% of you are gone. There are a lot of organizations, though, that didn't do that. Uh, there are organizations that instead reduces their payroll by 30%, but not, but not their number of employees. 100%. And, uh, and there are, like, there's great examples like um, uh, Patagonia is a great one to look into, where uh, uh, the, the leader refused to abandon the people. They, they, they felt that the needs of the organization would be achieved by just simply satisfying the needs of the employees. So they actually went back to the employees and said, look, I have an appointment. I, I, I'm being told to do this by the board. It doesn't feel right to me. What, what do you wish? What do you want? What do you need? And they all decided to have a major cut in their payroll. So I think that even if you have the burden of the organization, going back to your employees 
Um, and this is not servant leadership. This is not, but to connect back to the point, if we're all here to achieve a purpose in life, and we're all a, an organization, which is just simply a collection of people with processes that we surround ourselves with, um, and we're only here for a purpose, then we're all willing to flex. We're all willing to change. We're all willing to take care of each other because we're in this thing together. So I, you know, it's I, I'm not going to say that cutting 30% of your staff is the wrong thing to do. I'm going to say it's the traditional thing to do. But there is a new way of working and there's a new way of living. And agility is in that direction. And it, it requires a leader to have a sense of purpose, to be passionate and committed to their employees as, and, and, and satisfying their needs. Because as a result, statistically, organizations like Patagonia, who do that on a consistent basis, thrive. I 100% agree. Now, I have a bias for this, and, and Carlot knows why. I look at businesses like Afano, which is the uh, Tadeo for family. And if you are part of my Fano, I don't kick you out because the times get tough. I ask you, what can we do to get through this together? And, and Kurt knows this. He's part of my Fano. We, we will ride the ups and downs together. COVID was horrible. We lost 70% of our business in the first, like, was it three weeks, Kola? It was like, yeah. phone call, phone call. Don't need you, don't need you, don't need you. I was like, freaking out. We, we, would, we would never cut people. We were never like, is that you wouldn't cut your limb off. You wouldn't cut your sister out of your family. Um, we all just took, like, you know, we didn't earn so much, <laughs> you know, and that's okay. Um, obviously, companies out there, I apologize if that was your last result and you had to do that. I just urge you actually to think about all your results and maybe ask your employees what they think, which is what Ron just said. Um, mm. I get very irked by it. And look at the Nokia study in 2008. Yep, financial cl collapse. It was a big... GFC, totally. Nokia had the three biggest years of financial markets uh, leading up to that. They cut 30, 40% of their staff and the customers turned on them. They stopped buying Nokia because of how they treat their employees. And I'm hoping the companies out there that treat their employees bad, I'm hoping your customers turn on you too because that traditional way of doing things needs to go away. Sorry, mm -hmm. bias, big bias on that one. <laughs> Um, Mikey, there's a follow-on question by um, by Colin. There's a quite a quite a just to elaborate on that. I wonder, um, Ron, are there any reports of the business impact of Patagonia's approach? Uh, are there any reports? Uh, mm. uh, like well, there's uh, a there's a documentary. What was the flow on uh, effect, effect? You know. Yeah, no, there, there's a documentary that that uh, actually intimately evaluates exactly that pivotal moment. Um, so if you, I think if, if I think it's on YouTube, and if it's not, then it's probably on one of the streaming services that are quite mm. popular and dominating the world in the market. But um, uh, and Pat Patagonia's success is well, it's it's obvious now. You just have to research the company, and and yeah. and you can see yeah. its dominance in in the globe. But the reason why the documentary is an, an important watch was because Patagonia was not at the time of these decisions. Um, and they had a catastrophic uh, uh, crisis in their marketplace uh, that challenged them. Um, so uh, I, you know, I'm sure someone's written a report. I haven't written, re read a report, but I have yeah. read in, in a couple books of uh, this scenario, um, uh, one specifically about the leader. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I also uh, know that there's a, I enjoyed the documentary. I think documentary is really well done. So there's a, yeah. there's, there's, a, there's a couple of tiles out there. I just found one. Uh, how Patagonia became a $1 billion powerhouse with a heart. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and bear in mind, this is not going to work for all industries. If you have a commoditized product or you're looking at uh, just value add uh, things, you, this may not work for you, um, but it's at least worthy of asking the question. Mm. Worthy of asking the yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I, I'm not sure if um, if this is relevant, but I'm, I'm reflecting on, on experiences in the military. And um, there are times when you make life and death decisions. And yes, I know that um, cutting staff is not a life or death decision, um, but I'm, I'm just kind of uh, sensing into what it must have been like for uh, executives facing this dilemma of like, okay, we've just had um, all international travel stopped. Um, we've got no incoming tourism, and so that whole sector is just about to about to 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 hit this sort of rough patch. Um, and you know, the, I can I can 
I can understand there's a rationale that goes in order to protect the livelihoods of the families that are attached to the staff that are attached to this business model. We've now hit this position where the business model needs to be refactored in order for it to survive. Otherwise, the whole thing goes. So you're in this sort of horrible place. And I remember um, uh, recently, and it's it's not a, a thing, but um, uh, just looking at the role that psychopaths play <laughs> and the, the correlations between psychopathy and some of the big decisions that we have to make sometimes. Oh um, and there it turns go. out that's, I know, I'm sorry. I, I, I know this is a bit of a bit of a tangent. Yeah, this, um, this is good science, actually, yeah. This is a bit, bear with me. So, so it turns out that the, the, um, the talk that I watched um, explained or, or at least put forward that um, there are some positive attributes to, to psychopaths, that they actually do pretty well at certain philosophical dilemmas. So um, there's the old um, uh, thought experiment where they said you've got a train careening down a railway track and you have this terrible dilemma where um, it's, it's going to basically kill five people that are on the tracks right now. And then the first version of the thought experiment is that you have the ability to flip a switch and would uh, switch the train to an alternative track, but that alternative track is facing one person. And so they would uh, uh, run a railway, uh, the train would then uh, go and kill the one. So would you um, uh, sacrifice the few to save the lives of the many? And it turns out psychopaths find that pretty simple. They've got no problems <laughs> flipping the switch, yeah. right? <laughs> um, yes. uh, they take it a step further and they go, well, what if the next experiment was we up the ante? We don't say it's a, a, an abstract, you're distant by flipping a switch. Um, what if it's a big, a big burly man that's standing right next to the railway tracks? Um, if we made it really personal and it was an intimate act that you shoved that person onto the railway track and that would uh, derail the train um, and therefore live, save the, the five lives, but it would sacrifice the life of one. But you would physically have to act on that. It turns out psychopaths would have no problem with that. Uh, and but, but most the general public or the general humans would have a huge problem with that, right? And, I, and I'm just kind of sensing into the humans with compassion um, that have to carry the burden of responsibility again. And they, and they feel that the decisions fall to them. That, you know, and we've got recorded lots of amazing inspirational organizations like Patagonia, um, Stemco, uh, with Ricardo Semler's work in, in South America, um, yep. where they democratized um, the running of that business. So a lot of the decisions just didn't sit with some hierarchy. They were, they were distributed decisions. And they were early pioneers of this amazing um, approach to things, uh, to approach to those uh, handling those dilemmas, sensing and responding to dilemmas. And I guess yeah. this is where I'm, I'm kind of still coming back to um, the, the, the I, I would say those poor people who, had to, who were, happened to be on watch at that point, and it, they carried yeah. this duty of care. They were forced with this, a horrible dilemma it's a terrible choice yeah. to make so, um, which I, then I, led to that outcome right i, I will yeah. i will jump in because i love philosophy and i love that export i've actually read a book on that as well Carl Art. um the it's a, the G -Nol, G a few yeah i like i like i like the book it, it's a good area so the lack of empathy actually at one percent of the population increases the survival rate of the of the tribe and it's because of su the success rate of decision making right totally agree makes total mm -hmm. sense your examples though i love Especially from Kant's point of view. So uh, Kant talks about the greatest needs for the greatest number of people, right? So of course, why would you not kill one person to save five? It's, it's obvious. Would you kill your sister to save five? Most people probably wouldn't. But, you know, let's be honest, you should do. That's five lives versus one. The economical value of five is five times 4.4 million. Therefore, boom, right? Um, however, Kant always said that he didn't actually understand the true implications of decision making you can only make decisions based on what you know today so leaders why i always would say in this scenario is i agree with you Kyle. if you can't survive you need to make rash decisions you need to make 30 percent cut totally agree however if you can survive like you have 1.7 billion dollars in liquidable assets right? like one airline i know um for the last two years anyway um if you could survive what is the ongoing impact? Did you factor in the benefit realization or the, the lack of benefit realization from your customers after you release the 30%? And I see this a lot. I see this with Nokia. We see this with um, other companies. Um, what's that airline in, in the USA who was dragging people off the planes? Southwest. Southwest. Southwestern. Yeah, so um, they took a massive hit wow. because people started talking about it 
And yes, they save money, right? And they met their processes. Um, but the the ongoing impact of that is now Southwest has been thrown into like everybody else. So we have airlines here, Ron, that are like the people's airlines. And I'm already hearing the whispers of they're not really the people's airlines if they don't care about people. And how is that yeah. going to move on? And you can't factor that in. I'd love to be an AI and go calculate all the variables to have a known known and be like a little god where I can make a moral decision based on the greatest outcome for the greatest number of people. Um, yeah. But Colot's right. Swinging it back around. Colot is totally right. You have to make decisions in the moment with lack of information. But I just want people to be aware. Yeah, the best you can best, with what you got, man. The best you can, the best of what you can. Um, again, if you if you ever want to have a a one on one with me or Colart or even Ron, actually, why not? Uh, Ron, we'll add you to the website, uh, bookings.surge.coach, and you can get a uh, free coffee with one of us to talk about your moral dilemma. Uh, grab me if you want a <laughs> philosophical debate on um, sacking four people versus sacking uh, one hairy guy on a track. Right. Maybe it was the change I... that those four people needed. <laughs> oh, jeez. Sorry, uh, Ron. <laughs> uh, but w one thing that, uh, you know, to cap this off, one thing I'll do is I'll reflect back on the concept of, of uh, you know, what happens when you are forced uh, and instantly, and uh, into a financial decision of the fact that the company will not survive and it'll disadvantage the 30,000 because you, you, you can't let go of the, the 3,000. Um, and, uh, and if that's the case, uh, I, I still challenge leaders to, to, to think back, you know, I'll, I'll call it Colart's military reference. The, the, the Marines always have a, a, a catchphrase and, and it's actually a philosophy and, and they've ingrained it. No man left behind. That's their approach. And it has really nothing to do with the, the man that was left behind. If by some chance that they died, some by some chance there was, because they, because uh, those who survived, who live by that will know so impassioned that they will not be left behind and, mm -hmm. unless it's of absolutely the most extreme case. And even if they're the ones who are left behind, it's their own personal sacrifice done mm -hmm. willingly. And more importantly, when you have the concept of no man left behind, and for some reason in, uh, in a skirmish, two had died, the rest that stay there are even more tight because what they're doing is they're taking care of each other. And <clears throat> there's no leader there that says, that's it, you know, Ron's gonna be the one left behind. I've decided yeah. he's the one we're gonna sacrifice. This is the social um, contract, it, right? It, it, it's a social contract and and the kind of level of engagement because of that phrase goes so high like absolutely so high. and that is a life and death relationship yeah not not per se in, as, as extreme as most leaders today in an organization have to have to suffer but yeah. i think leaders today really have an opportunity um to really challenge themselves or whether they're a manager really by nature or if they want to be a leader. If they want to be a leader, they can work on the charisma, they can work on the storytelling, but more importantly, grab your sense, grab yourself a sense of purpose. I want to even question why the hell you wake up in the morning. Because if, mm -hmm. if you don't know why you wake up in the morning and it has to do with profit, market share, revenue, I tell you, that must be life sucking because that doesn't help you and that doesn't satisfy your needs. If you were to satisfy your needs by waking up in the morning, what is that? And to your point, Michael, and, what we, and suggestions of what they could do, what I like to do to ask mm -hmm. them to figure out their sense of purpose is, well, flip it around. What opportunity do you have to benefit society or people with the job that you have? Mm -hmm. Like, what is yeah. it? Do you make drinks? Maybe it's something there. Do you, I don't know, work on railways that help people get from one place to another? Like, what, do, what opportunity does your job give you? Because it's a gift, right? Your mm -hmm. job has powers, yeah. it has things to do. You can influence something in the world. So what mm -hmm. opportunity does that give you to do better in the world? And if there's something that's better, get a vision that's wild out there. Like if you do work on the railways and you're not a psychopath, then what, like the whole key, the key thing then is, is like, well, how do, can you benefit humanity by something that you're, you and your team can contribute? And, and inspire yourself with that. If you can find a connection and you find it emotional and you, you can really commit to it, then bring that by communication to others. And if others choose to follow you and believe in that vision, like save six children, 
there's mm -hmm. something meaningful that you've done in the workplace and there's something that you can actually do to inspire people to feel like they're a sense of movement they're in they're they're engaged they have a sense of purpose no longer do people get religious on whether it's scrum or kanban because that's a means to it right? Yeah. This is all about our purpose, right? It doesn't matter what it is, right? We're not going to argue about whether it's Kanban or Scrum. We're going to just use whatever works best for you because that's why we're here. We're here to achieve that, not mm -hmm. Scrum or Kanban. And it clears that all away. And so if you want to be a leader in your workplace, just connect with the opportunity that your job provides to actually better the, the human race somehow in some way. And then if you're followed, I would argue that would make you a followed leader, not a hollow leader. Nice, wow! I love it. It reminds me of a of a um a bit of advice I got when I was uh, fresh freshly in uniform, and it was from somebody I really respected. And he leaned over and he said, "You know what? Um, a good leader leads, but a great leader creates leaders." Yeah, you know, and it's um and there's there's the, that to me is an anti hollow leader. <laughs> that's the thing that fools you, you know. Um, so yeah, the carpi. That's uh. That's a really great place to get to, Ron. I mean, we're we're kind of at the tail end of our of our mm. conversation. I think. I wonder if um if we could start to get down to almost brass tacks, like what sorts of advice or practical things um would we offer some of our audience members who are quite lively, as it seems, <laughs> um uh, that they could try out tomorrow if they had to, um to get onto that journey of moving from hollow uh, to followed. Yeah. Uh, well, it's just that. Find the opportunity. Uh, first thing first thing I would suggest people to do is to look around their workplace. Mm -hmm. And who who are who are those that people follow in your workplace? Yeah. And uh, and and if you want to find fulfillment and meaningfulness in life and 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 they lead with a sense of purpose because those mm -hmm. choose to follow them then then find a way to work for that that individual because there's a reason why uh people like i just find like i i as i go from organization to organization to organization there's always a handful of those kind of leaders where mm -hmm. like and you'll notice it right when they get promoted or moved from one department to another department it's amazing how like 25 people just trickle over that organization <laughs> right and a lot of people say well you know it's just rick right rick rick brought his his people that's not the truth. The truth is the people followed Rick because mm. like they would not jump ship if they didn't like Rick. Like that's not the whole point. Right. So I think if you're going to go to work tomorrow, look around, like uh, who are those leaders improve your life by seeing if you can connect with their purpose. So what is their purpose? Maybe even ask a one-to-one, -one, like just for 15 minutes. You're, mm. I feel you're an aspiring leader. Um, I'm just curious, why do you come to work? What's the whole point that you do? Like, why do you think that you can make a difference in this organization? And with their expression, if you can connect to that, then try to find a way to work for them. You'll find it so much more fulfilling. Love but then that. the challenge is, too, is why don't you become the next Greta Thunberg in your organization? Yeah. Why don't you yeah. end up in Michael's group and say, I want to save children? Um, what is it that you could actually contribute? What is it that you could actually do that's achieving some kind of sense of purpose and vision and what would that be um and and as you change jobs you change opportunities and you can change purpose i changed purpose and vision every project i went into but i was committed to it and i loved it and i communicated it so you can just do the same thing yourself another thing that you could do too um uh, practically is there's something called ikigai from uh a japanese philosophy and mm. and ikigai is this concept of of looking for the purpose of your life uh, and uh, if you if you search for it, it's E K. You gotta help me call out here. E -K. I I K I G A I. Yeah. Okay. E guy. I'll I'll pop it um, in the comments. Good. And and uh, it's an interesting chart that challenges you on on what is the purpose of your life, and it looks at you and it looks at your experience and and and, and role in the ecosystem of which you live. First of all, what do you love? Another thing is. What are you good at, right? Mm. Another thing is, what does the world need? And then the other thing is, what would the world pay for? And if you work on the first two Venn diagrams of what do you love in life? Like, what do you love dolphins? Do you love the sky? Do you love flying? Like, what, what, what do you love 
in the world. And then after that, what are you good at? Are you good at knitting? Are you good at public speaking? Are you good at graphic arts? Like, and, and then what ends up happening is when you look at combining what you love and what you like, what you're good at, then you can start to explore, well, what does the world need that I could give? Right. Yeah. Maybe the, you know, the, some flying association needs a public speaker uh, and they need that in the world. And then you find mm -hmm. an organization that might pay for it uh, because you could be a speech writer for one of the CEOs of an organization such as Southwest. Like, so you, what you do then is you start to connect it. That allows you to yeah. find your own self purpose. If you found your own self purpose and you found what the world needs and what the world would pay for, then you are thriving. And not only are you going to show up to work happy, you're going to show up to work with a sense of purpose and a vision because it's going to connect to the organization. And I guarantee you, it will be infectious. I guarantee you people will listen to you and follow you and ask you what the next things to do because you're going to cut through all the crap of revenue, market, share, all that kind of stuff. Bureaucracy, and you're going to get yeah. a sense of purpose. And because that helps people satisfy their own needs of fulfillment and happiness and well-being, the organization, statistically speaking, thanks to Gallup, will mm -hmm. thrive. They will expand their market share. They will expand their profit. And they will expand their revenue. 100%. And I'll add to that, Ron, um, I'm a big believer, and we're getting into a bit of life coaching here, and I do apologize for those who go, oh, God, Michael, what are you getting into? But me and Kola, we love the startup scene, and there's a lot of life coaching that goes into the startup scene, because, and I'm a big believer, I start from this end, and that is exactly what Ron just said, it's do what you are good at, you're good at it, because you enjoy it, you enjoy it, you'll work harder, you work 87 hours a week delivering to your, to your area, and then people go to me, but that's not what makes money. I've got a friend in Auckland right now, right? He, he, I'll be a little bit careful because I haven't got that many friends in Auckland in this industry, but um, he's hit a couple of mil now with rubbish, literally rubbish collection, right? Because he just loves recycling. He loves um, sustainability. He loves all that kind of stuff, right? He got into picking up rubbish. He did the bottles. I think he was South African at one point, uh, picking up the bottles 10 cents each time. And now he's over here and he's doing this. Now he's got trucks, right? Doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't make money. Someone will pay for that. And you can be yeah. the best rubbish picker upper in the world. And I guarantee you, you earn billions, right? Well, as long as so, he knows why he's doing it, right? Exactly. And I think if money becomes the object of your fascination, you'll make less money. If, if, if you get more fun, focusing on the customer value or the employee value, as, as Ron's been saying, you will get more profit. Um, there's around three times more profit when you link to customer value as opposed to um, uh, actual profit. I, I don't know what employee value is. I, I need to run that study myself as well. Uh, I'm going to look into Gallup's uh, area. Thank you for that, Ron, because I and Cole, I'm going to look into that because okay. uh, we've focused on customer value these last couple of years, and uh, we're now shifting to employee value to look at the difference between... Um, I'm an ex-accountant, Ron, so I like profit in the day. I actually do enjoy numbers. I think it's a game. Um, but I like how if you focus on employee value, you're three times more likely to actually make more profit than you are if you focus on profit. And I'm starting to see the numbers on employee value being roughly the same, which basically means if you focus on people, you make three times more profit than if you focus on money, uh, which is fantastic for all those psychopaths out there who actually only care about the profit. <laughs> I love not, it. Not, um, not good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's nine oh eight, Ron, which means it's four oh five oh eight for you. It's uh, it's it's five oh nine in the morning here. Yeah. So so, Ron, what's uh, what are your intentions for the day? <laughs> uh, we're it's done. Not sleep. <laughs> my, uh, <laughs> no, it's not sleep. Uh, my intentions for today, uh, uh, I'm actually going to be working with a client who's focused a lot on business agility, and, I, and I'm actually engaged because there's a leader uh, uh, that's uh, in, in one of these financial institutions that booked an hour and a half with me because she's inspired by the idea of, uh, of what this agility really is and what she can do to, uh, to actually lead this uh, business agility transformation herself. Um, because she, she had a bit of a, uh, a moment where she realized that, uh, it's not about her, it's about the people. And it's also, mm. um, and she has a responsibility for helping, uh, people achieve what they want to achieve. So, uh, I'm really looking forward to that talk. I want to see how it evolves and where that goes. Um, and then after that, there's a friend of mine who, um, uh, because of COVID, she moved up from St. Kitts. Uh, she's a Canadian. 
uh, but she moved up to the Caribbean to take care of her, uh, her, her younger child. And, um, and she, and she's having a bit of a rough go because, uh, she abandoned everything that she had in St. Kitts just to take the last flight out of there to come wow. to Canada. Wow. Uh, mm. she did the right call as far as I was concerned, because it, uh, you know, she's being inoculated and so is her son. Um, and there's a lot of challenges with St. Kitts, but I'm going to go visit her this afternoon and take care of her and her son a bit and, and help them along. Awesome. Oh, awesome, That's my idea. Well, awesome. Well, th thanks, Ron. And uh, thanks, Colart. Um, I'm going to do my reflections now and I'll speak to you guys in a second then, all right? Okay. Cool. So, um, oh, it didn't work. Hang on. Things aren't working. Oh, that's because I've got it on. There it is. Kia ora koto, everybody. And thank you for listening to the for Agility Matters with uh, Ron and Colart. Um, so Mikey's reflections from this session, I, I must admit, I, I'm going to, um, I've made so many notes, Ron and Colart, so thank you very much. Um, I want you to take away from this. I think Ron will take away from this. Focus on the vision. Have a purpose that matters. Make it human. Make a human connection to that purpose. Don't leverage your authority. In fact, I, I, we didn't talk about it, Ron, but I, I kind of feel like pull away from that. Pull away from your authority that you have. Um, anyone can be a leader. We didn't get time to talk about that. We talked about that before we started the show. But the boys, we were all talking about, you know, anyone can be a leader. Greta Thunberg can be a, a massive leader. Well, she's a massive leader, but you know what I'm saying. Um, be followed. Uh, do better. Love yourself. Love getting out of the bed in the morning. I, I, I love that. Because if you don't know why you're getting out of the bed in the morning, then something needs to change. Yes, that may lead you to realizing that this is not the role and least role you want to be in. And that's okay as well. Um, look after your employees. They are what matters. People first, cultures. And if you're like me and you love numbers, I can guarantee you, you'll make a lot more money focusing on the people and not on the profit. Um, kia ora and good night. And uh, say good night, boys. Bye, everyone. Wish you the best. Awesome. Ka, ka <laughs> Take care. Thanks, guys.